in a new way. We all want to be great, don't we? I remember at the end of junior high, my leg muscles seemed to grow exponentially, and I was really strong and really fast, and I was really good at uh, track and field short distances. And for some reason, I got it in my head, well, I'm so good at this, let's take the show on the road, and let's go do some cross-country running. If I'm good at that, I must be great at this as well. So I had some swagger to me, and I'm on my way to my first practice for cross-country, and I'm on the bus, and I'm drinking Coca-Cola, eating Cool Ranch Doritos, followed off by a Mars bar. And I can tell you that the first cross-country practice, in about 20 minutes, that was expelled from my body. (laughs) But I was undeterred. I was convinced I would be great at this. I was running hills. I was practicing with my team. I was convinced I, you know, I'm number one. Why do you guys, why are you even showing up here? I got this. I got this. So the gun goes on the first race. There's 100 kids there, and it's a 5K race. And I'm in the lead for like 800, well, like more like 600 meters, well, maybe the first 400 meters. And then slowly start fading towards, not quite the back, but the back. I hit a wall all the way there. And by the end of it, there was a three or a six, or maybe it was a six and a three in front of my name. And they wanted to hand out participation ribbons. I'm like, I don't want no participation ribbon. Stuff it down your throat. Forget it. I'm here to be great. Have you ever felt that way? What is that? Where does that come from? Why do we listen to this so-called successful people? Why do we have this thing today of social media followers, right? It's all about the viral videos and followers and likes. In our day and age, there's a thing called an influencer. And that's a thing in a career now. <laughs> and they, way, they make way more money than any of us. <laughs> right? That's our world. Create some fame. If you're a sports person, uh, the GOAT is often a conversation. Right? And that means the greatest of all time. It's always online. They're always talking about this. Who is the greatest of all time? And even Canadian hockey players, we love hockey here in Canada. They always want to make the gold medal game, but if they lose, what happens? Some of them, all of them are crying, and most of them refuse to put the silver medal around their necks. What is that? (laughs) Right? They're the second best team in the world, but they're like, no, get it off me. Isn't that interesting? Where does this come from? I know for me, this idea of feeling invisible drives it a lot of the time. I think there's this feeling of being invalid or wrestling with that. Unless we prove our value and our validity, we we don't feel it. People want to be seen as great, and it seems like they'll do just about anything to prove it. Now, is this just a 2023 issue? I think it's very prominent in our hyper-individualistic culture here today. But I don't think it's exclusive to this time. I think it's a human issue. In fact, the ancient world was asking the same question and wanting the same thing. And we're going to look at that today. And we're looking at our series in the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to talk about this idea of greatness And just to start by saying point blank up front, I believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest human that's ever walked the face of the earth. There's no dispute there. But I want you to know that Jesus actually said there was someone who was dripping with greatness. There was a man, John the Baptist. And we're going to look at his life today. And uh, we're in our series in Mark. Uh, Mark is very concise and precise and short with his language. Uh, so the story of John the Baptist is in Mark 1, 1 to 8, and Mark 6, 14 to 29. But we're going to focus in on his story in Matthew and John, because it helps uh, fill in a lot of the things that we want to talk about here today. Listen to what Jesus says about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. As John's disciples, so John the Baptist himself had his own disciples. As they were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. 
And here he's speaking to the crowd. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Right? They heard about greatness and they wanted to go see it. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, here it is, there has not risen on anyone greater than John the Baptist. Friends, this is a stellar endorsement, right? We want the greatest person to give us the greatest endorsement about our greatness. That feels good. I think we want that. We want that acknowledged. And this is what happens for John the Baptist. Now, there's lots said about him in the scriptures, and I'm just going to highlight his resume a little bit here for you. See, he was born after an angel appeared to his dad, and the angel told his dad that they were going to have a kid because they couldn't have kids. They were barren. They couldn't have it, uh, a baby. Uh, So his conception was miraculous. And after the angel spoke to his dad, uh, that's what happened. He was born. And the angel actually spoke the name to his dad, Zechariah, that you're to call him John. And normally uh, the family name would continue on, but not in this situation. And then there's a story as we lead into Christmas. We're not going to talk about it today, but where... uh, John is in the womb, and Mary, who is pregnant with Jesus, shows up to talk to her cousin Elizabeth. And when John hears the voice of Mary, he's filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb and starts doing backflips because he's filled with the Spirit of God and he's excited about what's going on here. That's kind of crazy, right? That's unique. So God set him apart from birth. And I just picture this hairy man who, who wore camel skin for clothes and ate locusts and honey. The scripture tells us about that. Can you imagine the family photos, right? Elizabeth and Zechariah all prim and proper. And then there's John, all hairy, scraggly hair, you know, locusts hanging from the honey in his lips. That's what I'm picturing. And he's special. And he's Jesus' cousin, And I don't know about you, but if I'm like close to the guy, right? I'm like, yeah, that's my cousin. And I'm telling everybody about it. I'm name dropping. Have you ever done that? All of this yet was John the Baptist the greatest. You see, the people in his time are asking him the same question. Are you the greatest? Are you the one? John chapter 1 verse 19. Now this was John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests, see, even the Jewish leaders are sending messengers to find greatness out. They sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? We just sang about the days of Elijah. Elijah is a prominent Old Testament prophet. He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer. Are you the great one? What do you say about yourself? That's quite the question for us today, even, and in our culture. What do you say about yourself? How did he answer? Verse 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, so he responds with somebody else's words. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Are you the guy? And he's like, no, I'm not the guy. Are you the one? I'm not the one. In fact, in other places he says, I'm not even worthy to tie up the one's sandals. I'm just a voice talking about the guy. Who is it then? If you're not even worthy to tie up his sandals, who is it? You see, from the human side of things, John was. He could have clung to his own greatness. He was a special guy. Really, really special. It's interesting, though, when you read about his life, he's not impressed by himself or concerned about this kind of thing. 
But shouldn't he have made like a YouTube channel to live stream all of his sermons so that people would see who he was? Nope. He made no claim to fame about his own greatness. John the Baptist was never concerned about these things. Never preoccupied with himself. Why? He was caught up in the greatness of someone else. Why? Well, our first point today is Jesus' greatness outshines everything else and everyone else, period. In other places, John says, I'm the lamp and he's the light. John the Baptist says the greatness of Jesus surpasses uh, his own greatness in every possible way, shape, and form. In the Gospel of John chapter 1, it says this. John says, I, he gives this testimony. I saw the Spirit of God come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on is the one, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is God's chosen one. This, that person, not me. John is saying, I'm not the guy. I'm not the chosen one. There is someone else, and his greatness is greatness personified. So why should that make a difference to us today? Why should this message impact us? What am I trying to say to you? What is John the Baptist trying to say to us today? Well, let's look at Jesus' words about greatness again from Matthew chapter 11. And listen for the word yet. Listen for that word yet. Okay, from Matthew 11 again. Truly I say to you, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Do you see it? Can you hear it? What is Jesus saying? Like, oh, you're all terrible. Forget it. Don't ever try for greatness. No, that's not what he's saying at all. Jesus' greatness outshines everything and everyone, yet he's inviting women and men, boys and girls, into his kingdom to call him Lord, to follow his life, to be adopted by his father as sons and daughters in his kingdom, to lead a life shaped by him here and now and forever. So this is, friends, this is the greatest news you'll ever hear. This is the greatest truth, the greatest reality that there is in all of history, that Jesus Christ invites women and men into his kingdom to follow him. If you've said yes to God's love and his lordship through Jesus, it's an invitation in. And maybe you're here today and that's not you. I'm inviting you in to this great news today. And I want you to know that this is not the ending point of greatness. In fact, it's the starting line where the race starts to express greatness through your life. And in that you need to know today that your greatness shines the most and the brightest when Jesus shines the most through you. And in that, there's God's part and our part. We do have a part of contribution and participation. We are meant to live out greatness with Jesus shining through us. And one of the most striking and challenging and simple yet profound statements that John the Baptist makes is, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. That's the tension. Our greatness is actually at its peak when it's about somebody else. Do you feel the rub of that, the tension? Like, ugh. But we all know the opposite, don't we? When our self tries to shine, it actually is more like a fog and not a light. It kind of stinks, actually. And I think it's funny because we can see it or even smell it in other people. But we're nose blind, right? The Febreze, you guys know the Febreze commercial, nose blind. Nose blind. We're nose blind to our own self-centeredness. 
but everybody else can smell it and see it. It's this false attribution error. We see it and smell it on others, but there's no way it's me. No, no, no. We need to be honest about that tension today. That someone else in this life is the hero, and it's not us. But how can the greatness of Jesus shine through us more? Well, we can prepare the way for Jesus' greatness by looking at our own lives. See, he wants to express his greatness through our lives. How? Well, let's look at John's message from Isaiah 40, verse 33, excuse me, 43 to 5. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We can prepare a pathway for the greatness of Jesus to shine through our lives. Where we live a life where he's the hero and it's not us. Where we participate and we contribute our piece of this. And I think this part in Isaiah helps us to figure out how we can get there. It made me think of if you've ever driven from Edmonton west towards Vancouver area and you see how they've blown through rock and they've raised things up to get the highway through. It's amazing. Friends, Jesus is coming again. His his greatness will be expressed. And this is a historical thing. Isaiah existed hundreds of years before John the Baptist and Jesus. And then Jesus has come. Jesus has risen. And Jesus is coming again. And he wants his life to be expressed through real people in the here and now. And we have to take responsibility for that. And it's an invitation. Because it's happening whether we want it or like it or not. But he's saying, Come, be a part of this with me. Your lives can be a part of my greatness shining. Prepare a pathway for the greatness of Jesus to shine. And how do we do that? Well, I think this message of John and the message of Isaiah can help us. Greatness comes when we bring stuff low in our lives. What needs to come low in your life today? You see, often the kingdom of the world gets expressed through the kingdom of me. So, what needs to deflate or come down or get small? Maybe it's your ego. Maybe it's money in your life. Maybe it's control, where you've got to be the puppet master of every situation and every conversation. Maybe it's fear. I know for me, like fear, I want to say to you that faith has driven my life, but I know that fear has driven my life so often. We're survival mode and chameleon mode just to get through. God doesn't want fear to be big in our lives. Maybe it's anger. And it's Father's Day weekend and men, I think this is a, it's not just a male issue, but I think it's a big male issue. I want to say to you today that Anger is a secondary emotion. And it gets big in our lives, but underneath it, so it's got to deflate, and underneath it is something else. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's guilt. It could be fear. It could be insecurity. It could be inadequacy. All kinds of things. Does anger need to come low in your life? Maybe it's distractions. You're too busy. You're going too fast. There's too much for Jesus to get your attention. Maybe it's your rights or your schedule. It's all about your time and what you're up to. My, 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 it's all about I. You see, the message of John the Baptist was repent. And basically that means turn away. Turn away from those big things in your life. And I don't want to oversimplify this because there are some complex issues that lead to those things. But with God's help and in Jesus' name, go after that so it comes low in your life. 
And even today, you can repent and say, Lord, I turn away from fear. I repent of fear and I I ask you to help me and change me and bring this low in my life. But greatness also comes when some things rise up. What must rise up in your life today? You see, when the kingdom of me gives way to the kingdom of heaven, other things rise up. Maybe it's belonging. We're made for God. We're made by God for him. We're made for each other. And the scriptures tell us that our identity is actually found in him, that he chose us before the foundation of the world. We're meant to be adopted as daughters and sons. And does that need to rise in your life so you're defined by that identity and that you belong to him? I want us to be those people that start with our belonging in our identity in God Almighty. Do you have perspective We sang songs this morning about him being in control. That he is worthy of all glory and honor and power and dominion because he sits on the throne no matter what's going on in the world. Does that need to rise? Does that perspective need to rise up in your life today? Or maybe it's worship. Maybe you're standing here as we sing and it feels like there's a stone in your chest. We're meant to express joy to God for who he is and that he's happy to be with us. Maybe it's faith. Pastor Al talked to us about that a few weeks ago. And that faith is a muscle. Does your muscle of faith need to grow because it's just a little chicken wing right now? Maybe it's trust. We're made to trust other people and trust God Almighty. And I know that that can be a journey for us. I get that. But are you committed to saying, Lord, I want trust to grow in my life? Maybe it's hope. Maybe hope needs to rise. I love the definition of hope, and I've said it a lot, and I'll say it again today. Because I think we need this. I need this. That hope is a confident expectation that goodness is coming. Even if we were all people of hope in our world and that would rise up from us, that would be amazing. We would shine like beacons in a dark world if we were people of hope today. Could that rise in us today? What about our heavenly citizenship? Are you defined by the fact that God says that if you're in Christ, you're now a citizen of heaven? And we're going to be celebrating Canada Day soon, and that's great to have that passport and that identity. But friends, I want you to know today that the citizenship secured in the Lamb's Book of Life forever in heaven is greater than that, far superior. Does that define you? Does that need to rise today? Is it joy? Maybe joy needs to rise. The scriptures say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Are you weary today? Do you need the joy of the Lord to rise to be your strength? Whatever it is, talk to the Lord about that today and say, Lord, let that rise in my life today. You see, greatness also comes when you face the challenges in your life. What challenges are really there? See, we're meant to be people of risk and courage and to face hard things. I got to be honest with you. I love that song that we sang this morning. Here I am, Lord, send me. But it's, it's actually a really hard song to, sh- to sing, right? Whatever, wherever, whenever, God, here I am, send me. You see, in, in faith, in Christ, in Christianity, there is suffering, there is sacrifice, there is risk, there is courage required. We are meant to live a life of risk and courage and faith and boldness. One of the biggest phrases in all of scripture is, do not be afraid. And then God gives a promise, I am with you. So we need, maybe there's something you need to confront in your world, in your life, in your work, in your home, in yourself. Maybe there's something that needs to be reordered. 
And this may cost you. This may cost you something. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Listen to this from Matthew 11, again, earlier on. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, that's John the Baptist, where is he? Who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? As I read that, I feel the ache of John's question. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Listen to this, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I think the question John is asking, if you're the guy, you're the chosen one, you're the one, can you rescue me? I've played my part. Can you rescue me out of prison? And the answer, it's hard to swallow. The answer was no. He played his part. Here I am, Lord, send me. And he ends up in prison. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, it describes how the crooked king who he was confronting with the good news of Jesus, who is adulterous, uh, and his adulterous partner and her daughter plotted to kill him and he was beheaded. John was beheaded in prison because of his devotion to the greatness of the message of Jesus. Friends, this could cause us something. We need to play our role for Jesus to shine. But it ultimately means that the one we're to risk for is greater than the risk. That we're to have courage and we're to face the hard things and play our part because Jesus is greater than our sacrifice and any suffering or situation that we'll go through. And that there's a great reward for the faithful in heaven. Verse 6, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And I, I get it, that's tough, that feels really hard. But it's the truth. And so we want to reframe our perspective on our whole lives based on the greatness of Jesus alone. And our last point here today is greatness comes when we keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, if we're to do any of the things that I've just talked about, we need God's Holy Spirit to fill us and keep on filling us. Pastor Al talked to us about that a couple of weeks ago. And his wife, Lee, had a vision of a dry well. And this well at the bottom, it's like there's all this dirt and muck and then there's dust. And we, we try and do this Christian life by almost like getting that stuff and getting our own greatness at the bottom of the well. But the promise of God is, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit in abundance. Remember, we had all this dry weather and wildfires were starting all over the place. And then this week, it was just like, <sighs> let's move from the, the, the drought to the abundance of the rain pouring down on us. Let's be those people. Let's be that church who's not depending on our own greatness, digging up the dirt of ourself, but inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us. He won't force himself on us, though. We need to will to will that that will be received by us. So, will you will this? Will you ask for that? Will you receive this? The greatness of someone else actually coming into your life and then expressing himself through you. Somebody else's power, somebody else's love, somebody else's mercy and grace. We can do that again by John's message. Repent, turn from ourself and receive and confess we need it and then receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And as I was writing this, this phrase came to me. 
Where are the great heroes of the faith today? And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, right here. Right here. Because we are the ones that Jesus says, you are the greatest in the kingdom of God. You are the ones who can be filled with the Holy Spirit and express my greatness to the ends of the earth because I am coming again soon. And you can prepare the way for my greatness in the here and now and anticipate that great day with joy and expectation, even if it costs us everything. Because Jesus is greater. The heroes of the faith are right here in this room, watching online, wherever you are. If you've heard the message of Jesus, you are the great heroes of the faith. Will you prepare a pathway for the greatness of Jesus to shine through your life? And I want to just stop here and just talk to guys right now. It's Father's Day weekend. And this message is for everybody for sure. But what would it be like, men, if we just took the phrase of John the Baptist and made it our prayer today and going forward that he must increase and I must decrease. See, that's the way of the kingdom of God. The way up is down. And I dare us, men, to pray this on a regular basis. What could it be like in our works, in our families, in our in the places that we have influence, if we were the ones who said, we're going we're gonna to say this, we're going to pray this on a regular basis. And fathers specifically, what would your marriages and your families and your workplaces be like if we took that responsibility and we prayed that prayer? Lord Jesus, you must increase and I must decrease. I think God is so pleased with that prayer. And it's interesting that it's Father's Day weekend because the gift of God, the Father, is the Holy Spirit, is the Son, and is the Spirit to us. <laughs> Will we take advantage and lean into the gifts our Father on Father's Day weekend has given to us? What could it be like if Heartland, the people of Heartland, said, Lord, you must increase and we must decrease? What could it be like in our homes and our relationships, our families? in our church even, as we continue to express this. I just believe that the Lord's glory would come powerfully and his greatness would shine and our community would be transformed. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for everyone here and watching online. And I ask that you would, uh, they would see their place in your greatness today. That the things that need to come down would come down the things that need to rise up would rise up, that you give them fresh courage today and that you'd fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, specifically for men today that we would take initiative and responsibility to pray the prayer, you must increase, Lord Jesus, and I must decrease. And then take the steps that we need to to live that out as men today and going forward, Lord. God, I thank you for our fathers today. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that they would reflect you, Heavenly Father. You are the perfect Father. Lord, forgive us for all the ways that we have failed. We confess that to you now in Jesus' name. We repent of those things and we ask, Lord, that we, are, as fathers, would reflect you in better ways that your Holy Spirit would fill us. And, and Lord, I thank you that your word says if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. So I pray, Lord, for our fathers today that they would become more like Jesus. And I bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen.